here at Eagle Pond Farm on Route 4 in Wilmot, New Hampshire um, on a late winter or early spring day uh, in 2013. Uh, this is the home of Donald Hall. Uh, Don uh, is the former U.S. Poet Laureate. Uh, he has lived in this house since 1975, uh, but began, co began coming here as a very young uh, man um, and worked in the summers for his father, his grandfather, who was a farmer here, uh, living in uh, Connecticut in the suburbs uh, in the wintertime and here in the summertime. Um, Don has written an uh, incredible amount of all kinds of work, but he's mainly known as a poet. Um, he's written many of his books here. He finished a book called uh, Kicking the Leaves here, which is a very much uh, place-based poetry um, that sort of brings him back home here. Uh, his other fine books of poetry include um, The One Day, uh, and his last book of poetry came out uh, last year called The Back Chamber or the year before. Um, Don has since moved into writing essays, but he's really always been writing e essays and criticism, plays, uh, short stories, novel. I mean, you name it, he's done it, written for Sports Illustrated. Uh, he was a full-time professor at the University of Michigan until 1975 when he moved here. And when he got here, he became a freelance writer, so he took assignments for Sports Illustrated, The Ford Times, um, <laughs> Yankee a Magazine, and many, many others uh, during that period. Um, my name is Mike Pride. I'm the retired editor of the Concord Monitor. Uh, continue to write uh, and uh, to write history for the most part. Uh, but I've also been very interested in poetry during my whole time here. I came, in, I came to New Hampshire in 1978, three years after Don. Uh, we met shortly after that. Um, he came to talk with the Monitor staff about, uh, about poetry and place. And uh, I read String Too Short to be Saved, his memoir of his summers here uh, when I was a, uh, uh, first came to New Hampshire. Uh, and over the years, uh, I've reviewed most of his books, and I've also written many stories about him and his uh, wife, Jane Kenyon, uh, who, lived, who came here with him in 1975. Uh, she died of leukemia in uh, 1995. Um, and so um, that's basically it for an introduction in the, in the latter years, particularly since my retirement. We've become very close friends. Uh, I come up here, at, try to come once a month, uh, usually on about that schedule. And we go over to a place that uh, we call Blackwater Bills. It's not really Blackwater Bills, but it's on the Blackwater River. Uh, and we eat hot dogs. Uh, <laughs> Don likes his hot dogs with um, the spicy mustard and relish and onions. Um, so that's, uh, that's a, enough of an introduction, I think. Why don't we talk a little bit about your newspaper reading habits, since we, we do have some newspaper people in our audience. Do you still uh, read the paper uh, regularly? Yeah, I, I think I, I read two newspapers almost all my life. The New Haven Register and the New Haven Journal Courier. The Courier was the morning paper, the small, poor one. And the Register was the big one. And uh, then, I, well, I moved, I moved here and there. But uh, I moved to... Uh, uh, Ann Arbor, uh, where I was a teacher at the University of Michigan, and I read the Ann Arbor News, uh, which was not very good, and I added the Detroit Free Press to it. So I read two papers a day. And uh, come up here, and it is the Concord Monitor, which is the local paper, which you may know rather well, <laughs> and uh, the Boston Globe. My gramp here got the Boston Post was that a Democratic paper? I don't know. He was the only Democrat in New Hampshire. So I, that, my thought to the Post was a Democratic. And there we would hear the results of the Red Sox two days after it happened. <laughs> you know, so it would arrive at the post office, the Boston Post. That's all. And, uh, uh, but I came back here and it was the Globe and the, and the Monitor. I should say I read The Economist also. And uh, the, the Economist is a, a, a Time magazine that happens to be good. Mm -hmm. uh, and I have a friend in Venezuela. I read about Chavez when he dies. 
but not much in the Globe anymore. It has diminished, like old papers. And uh, for some, there's a part of me that uh, doesn't seem like the rest of me that wants to know what's happening everywhere. And uh, uh, the economist fills me in on the rest of the universe, but I get the uh, local and super local news from my newspapers. You, do you uh, you don't you don't use the internet at all? I don't have a computer. Mm. I'm probably the last person on Route Four uh, not to have a computer. Mm -hmm. I know one other guy in New Hampshire who doesn't have one. Huh? I just I'm, I'm terrible with uh, oh with my hands with gadgets with remembering what to do. I I'm more or less mastered the right of, uh, of the ability to change channels on a television. But it takes a lot of intellectual concentration. Um, and that's why I, uh, I, I was not high-minded or a principled Luddite, I think, to uh, refuse one when there were whole word processors and so on. And I welcomed uh, one for my assistant to use. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I was a typist for many years, but not two figures, one figure. And uh, well, I could get somebody to type for me, uh, I got accurate copy. And then when it could be a computer, when I made a new draft, I didn't have to look and see that new mistakes hadn't occurred when my typist copied it over. And you could just change it day by day. And if anything, that has intensified my desire, certainly my capability, to revise. If I want to change one comma on a page, my uh, assistant working with a computer um, can do it rather quickly, I understand. Now I know that you have been an incredible letter writer over the years, and now you do use email, kind of second-hand email. Yeah, for a yeah, lot of your correspondence. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I came to it because <coughs> I was driving everybody nuts. Uh, I was demanding that everybody uh, put names and addresses on envelopes and put in stamps and so on. And there were people who didn't want to do the mechanics of it. And they were used to emailing everybody. I had a, uh, uh, what's, it, what's it called when I had... And that was uh, God fax it. machine, right? I yeah, words. Yeah, I had a fax machine, and everybody that I was faxing turned out to be keeping their fax machine only because of me. Um, that was the quickness I had. But you know, everything has to be quick now. Uh, uh, mostly in New Hampshire, a letter will get there the next day, but nobody wants to use letters. I still write a lot of letters. I get away with it. I, and many people, I think I don't admit that I could get email through my assistant. And she's not particularly qu quick for me because, you know, I see it the day after it gets to her. Right. But that's okay. Uh, I have learned to be tolerant. Mm -hmm. But uh, I do, I, you know, I worry about the general speeding up of everything in the world. I worry about the... Uh, uh, intelligent young people, students, um, who, uh, for whom reading is too slow. Uh, all they want is a bit of information. They can get that very easily from Google. And certainly they can get entertainment, uh, two-way entertainment through games, constant uh, uh, television, television on the internet, um, everything. And everything can be quick, sudden, uh, delayed, or uh, 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 finished quickly. And a load, uh, someone writing a letter, especially like my mother and my grandmother, writing one long hand. And uh, my mother, my grandmother here had three daughters. And I believe that uh, she wrote them at least a postcard every day. And... Uh, I know my mother wrote her mother about every day. And uh, the post office was uh, three quarters of a mile down the road, and somebody had to go there every day. 
uh, possibly on a horse. When I was here, I got on a bicycle usually and picked it up because there were always the three postcards at least there from the three daughters for their mother. And Kate would sit uh, in a corner of the kitchen in a rocking chair underneath a little cage where she always had a canary who was always called Christopher. And she would sit there and read through and pick up her petty postcard, her two-cent postcard, her three-cent postcard, and write an answer. I grew up in that house. In my house in Connecticut, uh, both my mother and father wrote letters, but the main thing they did was to sit opposite each other quietly, each reading a book. I didn't know that. I thought all grown-ups did that all the time. <laughs> and the life was much slower, of course. This is any 80-year-old man talking now. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not saying anything original. Well, you know, when I was an editor, I would tell my staff to try to write for the newspaper as though they were writing a letter to an intelligent friend. Good. And I'm not even sure that if I said that today to a newspaper staff, <laughs> they would be able to understand the analogy or the, the comparison. A, a letter? <laughs> Um, what, what's that? But you know, for many years, you and I uh, drove together down to the Littman House and yeah. spoke with the yeah. Neiman Fellows about. Uh, we we would uh, we would tell them beforehand that we were going to tell them what a poet could teach journalists about writing. So I think we ought to talk a little bit about that today. And why don't we start with uh, one of uh, our favorite subjects, which is the dead metaphor? Oh yes, um, <laughs> yes, yes. Um, uh, and I, I, let me say first that I remember the first time this came up in a conversation. So do I. It was, <laughs> <laughs> it was uh, at, with the monitor staff, and we were sitting in the living room uh, of a friend, uh, actually a colleague uh, from the Concord Monitor in Concord, and you grabbed the newspaper to show people an example of a dead metaphor. You held up that day's editorial, and you pointed out the word, the verb trigger, and said, this, this is a dead metaphor. This is exactly what I mean. It's a word, a verb, or it doesn't have to be a verb, but it's a word that no longer calls up any sort of comparison with the original object. And it's, you know, it happens a lot in fast writing. So it's a, it's a lesson that we tried to teach our journalists to think just a little more about the words mm -hmm. they use and to get the dead metaphors out of their work. So would you... Absolutely. Teach us that lesson. All winter I read in the Globe and probably in the Monitor about a blanket of snow. Isn't that wonderful? And uh, it, it always uh, uh, annoys me, of course. And, uh, I hope I'm tolerant. But, uh, uh, and there are words which are used in the headlines because they are short, uh, which, you know, uptikes. Uh, a piece about Ted Williams. Mm -hmm. Hub fans bid mm -hmm. kid adieu. Mm -hmm. <coughs> and, uh, but Ted Belfort is something I, I notice all the time. And I criticize Trigger because I'm very used to doing it with poems. You can kid yourself so easily. I have written a draft of poem you know, 50 times, 60 times, and see a gross dead metaphor in it. It's easy enough to do it. Uh, but I have told, uh, I remember telling Galway Cannell one time that I would, uh, uh, I would never say dart for across a room quickly, uh, because dart is English men in pubs. A dart is an arrow, and uh, used again as, as a verb. Uh, it's like I was anchored to the spot, or I was glued to the spot means that a ship in a harbor and Elmer's clue are the same thing. You should remember that and maybe it will help you avoid uh, dead metaphor. But, you know, I was just reading the uh, wonderful uh, second uh, volume by Hilary Mont Montel. Do you remember the title? I was looking uh, down for it. The, the Wolf no, no. was the Wolf, first one. Right. Uh, I'm just, you know, carrying my usual uh, baggage, and she's a hell of a good writer, marvelous. And there was, uh, I believe, a blanket of snow in one <laughs> sentence. We can all do it. Uh, but I do it uh, to other poets, mostly. Uh, 
Yesterday I had a letter from a poet uh, whom I had criticized for saying shrouded in, uh, as a dead metaphor. I mean, you know, so the, the valley was sh shrouded in mi mist or whatever. And she wrote me that she did it because the owl repeated an owl in another word and the D in another word. And I said, okay, it's still a dead metaphor. Mm. Yeah. Mm. And, uh, now, what, what that, what that uh, you know, from a practical standpoint, what you're really talking about is helping writers, whatever they happen to be writing, pick the more precise word, right? I mean, it, it is precise because it is not sort of under the surface uh, another object. It, it is looking uh, straightforward. There are people who say that everything in language is originally metaphor. And I don't understand the, the thought may, may be true, but I don't deny it. But I remember telling Galway, I would rather say move quickly than say uh, dart. And Galway said, yes, move in the manner of a live person rather than in the manner of a dead person. The quicker the dead. Mm -hmm. But I forgive myself that one because I think that the, the, the use of the word quick meaning alive as opposed to death, is only used legally as the quicker the quicker dead. dead so. right. uh, but I was amused that he picked that one up so fast, you know, <laughs> good. But uh, with, uh, with a, a prose or whatever uh, that is full of uh, dead metaphor, no character could get through. Everything has Here's one of my common dead metaphors, a veil, B-E-I-L. Everything has a veil between the utterance of the speaker and the reception of the author, of the, sorry, of the reader, the listener. And uh, so uh, somehow a, a, a plainness is more intimate than uh, the, the word shrouded, the word blanketed, as we mostly use them. A shroud is a shroud, that's fine. A blanket is a blanket, I can write about it. But uh, don't confuse it with an item which covers, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. just don't make it that, mm -hmm. which can be shrouded or blanketed. Or mm -hmm. really. Why don't we talk a little about sound? Um, I, I know that in your poems, often sound is a really driving force. And I wonder if that, um, to what extent that you think that that is um, um, applicable to prose, and specifically to prose in news writing? I mean, the way you write sentences and the way, I mean, thinking about sound as you write, how do you do that? I, uh, uh, <coughs> I think sound has been for me, and not for everybody, the kind of doorway into poetry. Uh, and uh, by sound, I particularly uh, uh, mean uh, the repetition of long vowels more than anything else. Uh, but it is always repetition, and uh, repetition sometimes is a slight difference. You uh, use the diphthong of uh, A, and then you can half rhyme that with E, you know. And uh, for me, it, it it is a kind of inwardness, and in lots of ways I hear, well, I, I always say that I read, not with my eyes, and I hear, not with my ears, when it's poetry, I, I hear and see through my mouth. And that, the mouth itself, then of a reaction to the, to the sounds, and it's kind of dreamy and intimate, and it opens up that metaphor, the alleyway uh, to the inside. And this I particularly apply to poetry, and I think it is the chief difference. In poetry, we have the line break to organize a rhythm, and, and sometimes to give emphasis. If there's an enjambment, possibly to the adjective and the noun, the noun gets hit harder. The first word of the line, the last word of the line gets emphasis, 
not so many people notice that the first line, first word does too. In, I'm writing prose now rather than poetry, but I'm still listening. And a lot of my revision has to do with revisions. Some, some things are sort of obvious. Mix up long and short sentences. Mix up complex and compound and simple sentences. That's easy. But it is, I mean, it's easy to say, but uh, it is a, uh, a, a matter of rhythm of the dance. There is something bodily about the, the rhythm of a paragraph. And there is a rhythm within a paragraph. Uh, uh, oh, someone like John McPhee can write four pages without needing a paragraph because he is so terrific on transitions. But he is quite apt to have a four-page paragraph and then a one-page, a one-line paragraph. Mm -hmm. And that could be wonderful. And newspapers can do that too. But most newspaper men do not have time to write 42 drafts of every piece. And the structure of a news story uh, is a kind of form itself. Uh, the new news on top, the background afterwards, and so on. And I use this as who, any frequent newspaper uh, reader must as a way of uh, skimming. Uh, I could read the first part, but I know what happened before, so I can miss it. Uh, I would say that uh, the, uh, the newspaper writer, uh, an editorial writer, is sort of freer to be wild and metaphoric than a news writer. The, the news writer, you know, the Jack Webb thing, nothing but the facts, man. Uh, it, it has to feel like that. Uh, but there can still be adjustment in rhythm in the type of sentence uh, to uh, engage the uh, oh, uh, aspects of the reader which do not have to do only with fact, but with a sort of bodily joy and pleasure. And do that you, can be done. Do you test your poems by... Uh, reading them out loud, or or your prose. Do you do you read your prose out ever? I, I have tried that years ago, but uh, it doesn't work for me. Mm -hmm. I uh, I get too distracted by the sound of my own voice, and for that, I'm, when I'm reading to a bunch of people, uh, I don't listen to my own voice. I seem to I try to read my poem off the faces of the people in front of me, mm -hmm. and uh, I can be saying the poem and saying it uh, using more music. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not uh, acting my poems. I am singing them, if anything. And But I can do that while I'm thinking of the next poem I'm going to read, too. Right. Uh, but uh, I want, uh, when, the, when I was a teacher, I always read the poems I was talking about, and I realized eventually that I was trying to plant a voice in their head that they could read poems by, a, a, a voice that was alert to the music in it. And uh, the, the out loud could help to contribute that. And some of my old students, of course, by now they're mostly retired, <laughs> my, my students, but uh, they, remember, they would remember the voice and say that they have kept it mm. and so on. Mm -hmm. No, when, that, when I'm reading myself prose and poetry, I'm utterly aware of the sound of it, but it's it's not vocalized because it's just distracting. Mm -hmm. I I hear it. Uh, it doesn't seem in my head. It seems as if I hear it in my throat. <laughs> so so when you say that you hear and see with your mouth, how does that? manifest itself do you does your mouth move while you're writing sometimes or how, how does no that... i think i tell you if, if i've read a long time something well like henry james that uh, uh is complex syntactically i get very weary in the throat and i realize why oh yeah when i began to be a big reader every, everybody would say the same thing i thought speed was it you know, mm -hmm. I read a book in just two days today and it was a thousand pages. And so I, hell man, you have to learn how to slow down. And 
But if if you uh, try to read the Boston Globe that way, you just spend the whole day reading, reading one issue. You have to have different degrees of uh, uh, speed and slowness of hearing and uh, or feeling in the mouth organs. There's are different degrees of it all the time, different within kinds of prose and so on. And uh, in the, uh, most newspaper writing, uh, oh, God, it's just the obvious, I guess. I, I hear the editorials more, and I know who wrote them sometimes. <laughs> On the Monitor, I could tell Ralph. Um, but That's I, Ralph I, Menez, I a regular you, editorial page. I could not tell you the many needs. How I know it's Ralph, I don't right. think. But right. I can hear the voice. And in a news story, I almost not, shouldn't hear the voice. Uh, it, it, it would feel too twisted. Mm. I don't know. Is that yeah. always true? Um, there are some writers that I recognize by their by uh, the way they write the stories. I mean, but that's pro not. probably because I've been an editor for so well, long. You've been, I, right, you've been doing the, yeah, the pencil, right? Right. right. Um, but, and so, so yeah. um, you recently uh, stopped writing poetry. Would you talk a little bit about why sure, and how sure. that happened? Yeah. It happened gradually, and uh, I didn't know it was happening, uh, but uh, none of my poems, or very few of my poems, or few little parts of them, began to feel uh, dense with a, uh, uh, a kind of excitement of language itself that came by the density of sound and metaphor together. Also, are not unrelated, the poems started to come the way they used to. And they used to come in little meteor showers. I would begin uh, three or four poems in two or three days. They'd come to me, I'd be sitting, or I'd be driving, and I'd pull over the side of the road and write something down. And then it might not happen for six months. But I had four or five new poems to work on. Rarely, but occasionally, they would turn out to be the same poem. Uh, but they felt different and so on. That stopped. The meteor showers stopped coming. And uh, I, I knew a lot about poetry, and I'd been working in it for years and so on. And I pushed. I didn't want to stop. But I began gradually to realize that there was less and less of the uh, the old, uh, <laughs> like a picture, the stuff on the fastball that I had had when I was younger. Nothing would come out, even like Kissart. Kissart is sort of a poem without an idea in it, but with uh, a lot of shape and form and, and pleasure, I think. It's, uh, um, and I, uh, I felt it going very gradually. So that every now and then one would resemble the old ones, and so on. But in 2008, I began the last two poems I wrote, and I worked on them a couple of years. But I, I knew by that point, uh, uh, pretty certainly, that this was the end of it. It had gone slowly. I had done it for 60 years. What am I complaining about, <laughs> you know? Uh, but at the same time, I've written prose I published first books for 50 years, uh, and uh, I began to uh, substitute uh, prose for poetry, with, which is uh, where what I do, oh, when uh, I published a piece in the New Yorker called uh, Out the Window, uh, I talked about getting old, and I talked about not writing poetry anymore. And of course, the letter that the New Yorker published had many People who wrote me said, it is poetry. Okay, it, it was decorative, it was pretty, it has some good metaphors, it has some good sound in it. And uh, so I'm happy. If you call something poetry to praise it, that's fine. But it's not a poem. It's, it's, it's something else again. It works by the uh, paragraph, and within the paragraph by types of sentences, not so much by... Uh, uh, moments of assonance and so on, mm -hmm. but uh, certainly by rhythm. God, rhythm, rhythm is utterly important 
to prose. And I read whole books of prose, which are intelligent and full of fact and so on, and never does the author ever seem interested in writing anything that's beautiful or that's balanced or rhythmically taking. And it's hard for me to finish such books, mm. uh, intelligent and informing as they may be. Uh, but without but, beautiful writing. Yeah. And I, uh, I find a mess. When, when I was young, and I was writing poems all the time, I would write a book review from the New York Times, and I think I would often write it in three drafts. And uh, when I wrote String Too Short to Be Saved, which was the first book 50 years ago or so, first book, uh, it took me quite a while to write the first chapter because everything I wrote sounded like an academic lecture or a book review, and I had to find another way to write. And I finally did. And by the end of the book, I was pretty much writing three drafts. Mm. Uh, I was quicker then than I am now. But mm. for God's sake, I'm 85 years old. Why, should, <laughs> why shouldn't I slow down? Um, and to, to get an effect as uh, good, it's different. But forgive me if I call them both good. Um, a string too short to be said, something I'm writing now, is likely to take me uh, you know, up to 50 drafts mm. to do it. Mm. But I don't complain at all because I love doing it. Mm. I, I love the writing, but I love the rewriting, too. Uh, and in fact, rewriting is much more fun than writing. And that was always true with poems or everything because uh, the first draft always has so much wrong with it. That's one reason why I admire good news for everybody. Man, I cannot imagine being able to do it. Uh, Steadily, completely, and finished. So, if I had been one, I probably could have learned how to do it. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. but uh, it's very distant, <laughs> very distant now from the way I've worked and learned to work. I want I want to talk more about the prose, but I, uh, that you're writing now, and and I do think that there are some ways in which it it uh, the way you do it uh, would be interesting for journalists to hear. But I I um. I also want to go back to something we talked about a little earlier yeah. today, and that is um, after Jane died, you told me today, and I hadn't really thought about this so much before, that instead of trying to not imitate her voice in your own poems, you basically collaborated with the spirit of her uh, writing and producing some of the poems that you wrote after her death. Could you talk a little bit about that? It, it was quite conscious, too. But I had not so consciously, earlier while she was alive, found myself writing poems which, in retrospect, were deliberately as little like Jane as possible. And this was when Jane kept getting better and better and better. And uh, uh, we, obviously the situation of two poets living together and writing together and publishing together is inherently competitive, and the two of us are very good about keeping it from uh, coming between us. Uh, and it was consciously, uh, we did it, and we succeeded, really. But uh, one, of, one of my ways here, I think, of not, not competing was in writing in a way that was sort of the opposite, or almost anathema to the way that uh, Jane was. When when she died, <laughs> maybe the only good feeling I had was that now I didn't have to do that anymore. Uh, and you know, for the for the next what six or seven years, I, I didn't write about anything else. Pretty right. much, I wrote about Jane's death and my grief and so on. Uh, and consciously, uh, I I chose a word that she might have chosen. Sometimes, or ones that uh, uh, she did use. Uh, I'm trying to think of an example now. There was her poem, Afternoon at McDowell, uh, and uh, I believe in the, how was the word, necessities of art, uh, but what uh, uh, 
prodigy, prodigy. will keep you safe beside me. Right. Did I used prodigy or prodigious in the first poem I began. About a month after she died, I was able to uh, to write about her, write about her death. And I used that poem and another one um, that was an important, uh, uh, unusual, un not commonly used. Even prodigies, not common news. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I, was, I was free to do it. And it just sort of opened up more. I'm not sure that the poems, I don't, nobody has said that the uh, poems of without or subsequent were trying to imitate Jane or too much like Jane. But I knew uh, a difference was. And it opened me up, it gave me more freedom. But also it seemed a kind of homage to the poet of wonderful work and whom I loved eternally and, and who had died on me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so let's, let's go back to the, the, the prose that you've been writing and talk a little bit about Out the Window. I know from previous discussions that you, um, you felt like something was missing when something happened to you in, in Washington, D.C. that gave you something that made it such an extraordinary piece of writing. Uh, one of my dogmas, a lot of people's dogma, is that everything has to have a counter motion within it. This is a little poem, a big poem, a novel, whatever, maybe more than one. But uh, I, was, I wrote about looking out the window and sort of sitting passively, watching the snow against the barn, loving the barn and watching it, and uh, all the plowing of the snow, and then I eventually went into the other seasons. I could see out the window. And, but it was all of sort of one tone, uh, a kind of old man's love of where he lived and what in his diminished way he could uh, enjoy uh, and with without any sense of loss. Okay, it was fine. And I was, I was almost finished with it, you know, at one point. And then this wonderful thing happened. <laughs> I went to uh, Washington with Linda, and we went to the various museums. And in the uh, National Gallery, we were walking around, and there was a Henry Moore uh, carving. And, you know, I'd written a book about Henry Moore and so on, but uh, the, uh, a guard, being kind, Came up and said, that's Henry Moore, and there's more from here and there. So, thank, thank you, and we just went out. And an hour or two later, we had lunch at this is the National Gallery. And when we came out from lunch, the same guy was there. And uh, my legs, I have no balance and so on. And Linda was pushing me in a wheelchair around the museum. And the same guy, uh, asked uh, Linda, did you like your lunch? And uh, Linda said yes. Then he bent down to me in the wheelchair, stuck his finger out, waggled it, and had a kind of hideous grin, and said, did we have a good din din? <laughs> <laughs> and you know, people said, did you pop it? You know, and said, no, ah, we're just sort of amazed, and uh, walked away without saying it anymore. But uh, then that made me think of, uh, I, mean, I thought it was very funny. Uh, and uh, you know, because I was in a wheelchair, I was old. I was obviously had Alzheimer's. Um, and it made me think of uh, little pieces of condescension. And uh, one came from the monitor. And, you know, I don't want to hurt anybody's feelings, but somebody wrote a letter, it was her being perfectly kind. But they called me and they said that I seemed to be a nice old gentleman. <laughs> and, you know, a uh, nice old gentleman is to phrase you, somebody who's sort of doddering over in the corner, and you're, you're flattering them, you're praising them. And uh, I don't know, really, I thought of others. But especially the story about the guard uh, gave me the counter motion. So you yeah, like being old, <laughs> yeah. or whatever, or you know, uh, people who kind of said to you so. Mm, yeah. so I, I do mean somewhat. When uh, a lot of people, I got tons of mail 
about that uh, essay. Uh, and uh, people said it's really poetry, people said a lot of things. But a lot of them talked about the museum card. And uh, they were sort of indignant, why didn't you pop it? And uh, uh, so on. And I've lost my track. Uh, uh, Terry Gross uh, did a uh, an interview an interview on NPR, and she brought a lot of this guy. One one person wrote in in the uh, uh, instant electronic way. Uh, several people wrote in and enjoyed it, but that one one said that uh, I was. Uh, uh, I'm an egotistical idiot for being mad at this guy because he didn't know I'd written a book about Henry Moore. <laughs> Somebody else wrote it and he corrected him too. But it got a lot of attention, that part. Right. And uh, I, uh, I think it made the essay. Right. Uh, it was absolutely counter. It was, I thought it was funny. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there were other kinds of conversation also. Uh, and. Uh, it belonged to, as well as my pleasure of looking out the window and all We that. had a similar experience when you went to get the National Medal of Art and someone wrote in a blog that you look like a Yeti, right? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. But uh, that was, this was a... Uh, I'm just, I'm amazed at your sort of amused uh, reaction to those things, you know. They would make me mad. Wow. <clears throat> uh, it did make me mad when I read that. Right? Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> and Ralph, too. And, yeah. you know... I'm Ralph's editorial uh, pleased me enormously, mm -hmm. uh, the way he took it and so on. But, uh, uh, you know, I didn't get mad. It was, it was all too silly. And uh, there was a blogger from the Post who Casey Blake's articles printed also. She graduated from Harvard 49 years after me. <laughs> and uh, uh, her job was to be outrageous and uh, stir people up. Mm -hmm. And so she printed a uh, picture of, my, of me taken by the Associated Press in which uh, oh, my big beard and my uncombed hair and uh, uh, I don't know, uh, oh, President Obama's a tall guy. I used to be a lot taller than I am now, <laughs> but in any case I'd be saying that. There I was kind of jumped out. And it did look uh, well, a little funny. And she printed it and said that uh, she um, had a contest for a caption to the photograph. Uh, and she warned her readers, this is not a Yeti. This is, I think she said this is a poor Donald Trump. And uh, then, goodness, I don't know how many responses she had, but they, they went on for page after page after page. And the, many of the first of them were, were giving uh, 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 captions, all of which were pretty stupid. It was all about, can I see your birth certificate too, or uh, yeah, something like that. And some of them were two or three lines long. They <laughs> hadn't captured anything. And uh, then the counter things started to come in. And there were a lot that were, that were really nice. And there was an editor at the Weekly Standard is that it? It's a mm -hmm. conservative paper. Mm -hmm. Who wrote a really nice thing and said he'd meant me. But, you know, it was an attack on the liberal post, too. Right. He didn't make a big thing of it. But I was extremely flattered that a uh, message had come from Alaska. Sarah, Sarah Palin had said that the WAPO, which was lib, had insulted an 83-year-old cancer survivor. She didn't know my name, apparently, but <laughs> <laughs> she didn't need to. But uh, anyway, it went on and on, and at Stanford uh, the University, uh, they had a, a sort of special uh, a section of uh, their uh, blog for alumni in which uh, people were defending me uh, or saying I shouldn't be treated so bad. I was a, I was a poet, I was serious. Some said I wasn't quite as good as they liked, but I, I deserved to be better treated than that. But no, I did not, uh, I, th I thought it was funny. I didn't take it seriously. I don't think that the young woman 
had anything serious to say. Mm -hmm. uh, she was just starting the pot. Right. She was right. getting answers. Right. Doing what they wanted her to, right. you know, the book. And uh, so I wrote a piece uh, about actually just about being in Washington because I, I went there first when I was sixteen and. I, you know, I went to the protest of Vietnam War. And I went there because Jimmy Carter had a party for poets, and then I went there with, for Obama to put the medal around my head, or when I was laureate. Then, right. and uh, I end. Uh, she gave me something to end with. Uh, that uh, yeah, but most of it had been, uh, you know, if anything, self-flattering. I'm a poet laureate. I got a gold medal. Mm -hmm. uh, you try to downplay it, but, <laughs> but you are saying that. So here's from who thinks I look like a total idiot, and uh, I could bring that in, and uh, I guess that uh, provided the counter motion. It was right at the end, but it may have helped to, uh, you know, cut down on the mere egotism of right. some of the rest of it. Right. Um, why don't we talk a little more about the essays? The um, what you know you you have said I think today that you are revising those a great deal more than you did the final chapters of uh, String Strange, to Be Short right. to Be yeah. Saved yeah. Uh, fifty plus years ago. Um, what are you looking for in the revision? What kind of changes are you are you making when, as you as you work through the essays? I'm sure there's some variety. Yeah, but in, you know, over your lifetime, I'm sure yours, your your Prose can change a lot, and I know that uh, when when I uh, wrote "Strange Short to Be Said," it was uh, uh, soft and luxuriant to remember. And I had room for some uh, images that I remember with pleasure, like seeing a whole forest of rock maple trees knocked down by one blast of the hurricane like a combed hair. Mm. I like that. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, But later, when I wrote Seasons in Eagle Pond, many years later, my prose had become much more conscious of itself and sort of uh, uh, showy and uh, I still, I, still, I still like it. I probably like uh, uh, strings prose better than that. And now it's hard to characterize it. Uh, I think it, it takes so much longer, probably, not because of its nature, uh, but because my energy is less and my, maybe my imagination needs to go over a set of words many times to get it right. Uh, but I don't mind, as I've said before. I like it a lot. And I dream up uh, uh, new things. Uh, some of them are funny. Oh, all of the uh, new essays have age in them. Um, some of oh, the first one, uh, out the window, sort of about age. And uh, the other the one about uh, poetry readings has to do with reading when you get old, uh, that's all. And at other points, some structured, I, I saw an essay structure, would, would, wouldn't be newspaper structure, that I've enjoyed is sort of uh, introducing at the very beginning something that will turn up at the end, extended, and not in just the same way. It will be sort of put down and picked up later, and I need to change when I do that. I, I realized that I was getting into uh, just being funny. Because I'd never written much to be funny before. And uh, I really enjoyed it. I wrote a piece that Playboy published, which was about attitudes toward smoking in the 50s or 60s. And now it does happen that I'm one of those evil people who has continued to smoke. Uh, and I'm not telling people they ought to smoke. But uh, I think it was a, a, fu a funny piece I put together. And I really enjoyed it. And I've just done one about uh, three beards. I wear a beard now, and uh, I most of my adult life, I guess, I've had a beard. But there have been long time sessions where I haven't. So I'm just writing about three beards. 
And is there an idea in the whole piece? Maybe, but I'm not sure. <laughs> uh, this anecdote, and it is, uh, it sets off different times and the era of different times. The 50s, the Hagrypsa, you know, the, that sort of, and I was in Ann Arbor during the 60s in the protests, which was a way to be at the center of everything. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, I enjoyed writing about that. And uh, now I uh, am writing an, another essay from another set of uh, points of view about uh, uh, getting old. Uh, but I've thought of writing a, a, an essay called uh, uh, Physical Malfitness, which is really about uh, how what I, I've always been a terrible athlete who loves sports and uh, how I've always sort of fallen down and been clumsy, how whatever uh, chance I had to get out and exercise, I always had some excuse not to. Uh, but I don't, I don't know. It's, uh, I think I could make it so that it was funny. Uh, but maybe I've done enough of that now. Uh, maybe I won't. I don't know. I have a few notes. Now, the, these, these, uh, these essays, many of them are what you, I think, at one time called essays in memoir. Yes. And I'm wondering about the um, um, license that the memoir part of it gives you. I know that the book that you recently brought out called Christmas at Eagle Pond was based on a fiction, really. It's a, it's a memoir and fiction. It's all almost. fiction. All yeah. fiction. The, the people are all real. And it was one of those things that I've had before where you start writing and you begin to believe it's real. It seems real. The people are distinct. And the way they talk is the things. But I remember the people, but the actions never took place. Mm -hmm. And uh, but you know, I, I knew that it hadn't happened. But my my, my head writing it almost felt that it had, and you know, it was a pleasant experience that way. Um, in uh, some of these uh, oh, essays, especially the lighter ones that I have done. Uh, I have uh, oh, lied about something. Uh, maybe I've given something the wrong name or somebody the wrong name. Uh, every time I've done that, I've known it, I've considered it, and I, you know, I haven't thought that uh, I harmed anything, you know, by doing it. But uh, oh, I uh, it just makes no difference at all. I after I was divorced in Ann Arbor. I got invited to dinner parties, so I gave dinner parties. And uh, they were, I won't tell you all, but they, they were fairly comic things. But at the end, I said, uh, uh, um, my guests really liked my in dinner parties. There were eight guests. I served eight, uh, chilled eight bottles of Chateau de Camp. I changed the wine to be something much more pretentious. Four or five words longer, and I I did serve the wine, but I have no idea what I served. Right, and it's so much better to give it a name than it would right. be just to say one, whatever it was. I don't know. So, so that's my last now. But uh, this is uh, I, I've written uh, I have written quite a few books of prose, and except for textbooks. I think all of them have been memoir. How can you, and by poems. Uh, at the beginning, my prose poems had nothing to do with me. And, uh, well, most of them, almost all of them. And as my life has gone on, one thing I've said is that I began writing fully clothed, and I took off my clothes bit by bit, <laughs> and now I'm writing naked. And that's a bit of an exaggeration, but it has its truth. Mm -hmm. And uh, in the uh, autobiography, uh, in Strain, there is uh, oh no, uh, I don't think there's anything in it that uh, uh, could. The only thing I, no, not even that. 
is there anything in it which disapproves? In a way, I wrote about a cousin of mine, and who lived by himself, worked a lot, but he didn't do anything. Uh, and I sort of uh, condemned him for not doing anything. And the, I think that that was just a young man's ambition. Uh, and, but everything else that it is positive, what I mean to say. And as the memoirs have gone on, uh, I have not uh, talked about many of the most intimate things, but I did when talking about Jane uh, in, in prose, to a degree in poetry. Uh, and uh, yet it does sort of embarrass me to realize that my entire, li entire life has been writing about myself. <laughs> um, <clears throat> let's, why don't I, we just uh, close with just a, a brief discussion of you're 84 years old, and what are your writing habits now? And what does it do for you to wake up in the morning and write? Uh, I'll be 85 in uh, September. September, right. And I've, I've been sh showing people a picture of me that looks very old, and remarking that until you are 20, you want to look older than you are. From 20 to 80, you want to look younger than you are. After 80, you say, see how old I am. <laughs> and uh, I, uh, when I was younger, until, well, after Jane died, I would work, wake up at five or six to get to work. And now I wake up feeling sluggish. Uh, maybe we wrote it more the way Jane did. And it takes me a while to be able to write. But I keep it right beside me. And there are two well, three. One almost finished essay, and two that I'm working on. And uh, I think about either of them. If somebody's driving me up to the doctor, I may be thinking about it, you know, or in the middle of the night. I have still gotten up in the middle of the night and written notes, most of which are too illegible in the morning to read. Uh, but they're there all the time. And... Uh, I can turn to them, and oh, sometimes I'm waiting for somebody to come, and they'll be here in 20 minutes, and I'll know that, and so I don't think I can't uh, oh turn myself wholly over to my work now, but it's 20 minutes, and you know I can write a page, page and a half, and so on, and the sense that uh, I have. Well, since I was 12 years old, uh, and more firmly since I was 14, having something to do has meant running something. And uh, uh, that's almost, you know, every day of my life. I've always made a point of doing a little work on Christmas, just so I could say I worked every day. And, or just so I could know that. Uh, Jane and I once were sent by the State Department to uh, China and Japan. We were away for seven weeks. And during that time, I wrote nothing but postcards. And uh, toward the end of it, a, uh, a museum director had a caption to write. And his English was fine, but he wanted me to look it over. Uh, and there was two sentences. They were perfectly grammatical. But I found a way to make it, uh, to cut it, and make it one sentence with a clause. And I did this, and I felt this happiness stealing over me. I was working. I didn't care what it meant. You know, I understood enough to write it. But uh, it didn't come from my heart. It came from my love of language. Mm. I'm messing around with it. And uh, that's what I do now. Today, when I'm working, I'll pick up a, oh, a typical one is a sentence that begins with the main clause and then dwindles off with the preposition and sinks down. And mostly you can solve that by simply turning the sentence around. But you can't do it every time because then you get into the boring, repeating rhythms. And uh, I find that the uh, dependent clause in one sentence, 
really belongs in the next sentence. The story continues, but the, the qualification that the quality needs to be moved, and I change it. And you know, even when it's the that that happened in the forty fourth or forty fifth draft mm -hmm. of the thing I've been talking about, and. Uh, I please, it pleases me. <laughs> I've done something. <laughs> I've uh, got something straight. And, uh, you know, and I'd change individual words, get more precise. And one, one thing that's kind of common is that um, any verb adverb combination can be done better with a more exact verb. Mm. Uh, you don't have to say move quickly. But don't say dart. <laughs> but uh, there, there are plenty of words you could use to put quickly. But uh, yes, I take out adjectives and adjectives. And then maybe that's the earliest thing I, I do, is take out, oh gosh, so many times in writing I qualify. I say, uh, uh, sometimes I don't remember when, and all you have to say is uh, once. Uh, something happened or something. And uh, you're always cutting, very seldom adding. Mm -hmm. But sometimes you realize that you left out something important. Right. And you put it in. And uh, you know everything I'm talking about. I'm just doing it slower than you do it. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you so much. It's been great to, great to talk this afternoon with my friend Donald Hall. I always love to talk with you, <laughs> on camera or off. <laughs>